My name is Claire Aslan. I'm with the Landscape Conservation Initiative at NAU. And it's really a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I've actually been able to talk at the Festival of Science. I've been an attendee a number of times, and so I was really stoked to be able to find an opportunity to come and present a little bit to you all. I'm going to talk about research that I do that involves the relationship between species extinctions and the function of ecosystems as a whole. And the work I'm going to really highlight, there's two projects. One takes place in Hawaii, where I've been working off and on for about 20 years. And the other takes place close to here, just north of, well, kind of northeast of the Grand Canyon over by the Vermilion Cliffs area. So I'm going to highlight both of those projects. I'm also going to start at the beginning by just trying to explain this issue kind of with a more global focus. And I'm happy to make this a bit of a dialogue. So if people want to break in and ask questions, we can certainly slow down and talk along the way. Um, I don't really mind if we don't get through everything that I was going to talk about. I'd love to, to address things that are on your minds. So please feel free um, to interrupt me or raise your hand, and we can, we can have a conversation. All right, let me test this out. No. Just kidding. Hey, excellent, thanks. <laughs> okay, so when I think about biodiversity on Earth, of course I think about all the species that we can see in all these different groups where we've got mammals and we've got birds and we've got fish and we have insects and we have plants, but I also think a lot about how they are all interacting with each other. A really important part of diversity is the interactions that these species are doing with one another and how they assemble into these big ecological communities. And within that, then, there's a question of, well, what happens if you take some species out of a community, or what happens if you bring new species in, and how does that then ripple through and affect the biodiversity in any particular location? And some of the work that I've been doing has really a, a fully global application where I'm thinking about some of these changes in diversity across the globe, and then others are really specific to a site where we're trying to understand small changes and what their impact might be. And most of those changes are coming from some element of global change. So this is kind of like the scary slide that I have to put up kind of at the beginning of talks like this to explain that conditions are not the same as they used to be, and they're shifting in a lot of different directions. So we have you know, fire regime shifts, which is a huge one in this area. And some of that is driven by this big drought we're in. A lot of it's driven by our history of management in the area and our changing understanding of how forests work. We also have shifts in the distribution of habitats, you know, lots of fragmentation of forests and clearing of land and changing of land use. And that's going to, of course, impact the species and the communities that were there. We have changes in temperature and chemistry in the oceans leading to shifts in some of these ecological communities. We've introduced diseases. This is white nose syndrome on the nose of a bat. And we know our bat populations are heavily impacted by diseases such as this. We have invasive species, of course, that are coming in and really altering communities. So what I tend to do is I think about these big global changes and I think about, well, what's the impact at a local point on the land, wherever I'm standing, and how does this manifest? And then often, what do we do about it? What exactly are we supposed to do in response to these changes? Are there, are there measures that we can take? So we know that some species that become extinct are particularly important in what we call ecosystem functions. And so a function in an ecosystem would be how that particular species is interacting with other species, as well as with the abiotic environment, with the ground, with the land, with the soil. What, what sorts of changes is it causing in that landscape? Here's a couple of examples. This is a gomphothere, which was one of the ancient Pleistocene megafauna that we had throughout the Americas, and a dodo, okay, which is a much more recent extinction. And in both cases, these species became extinct, and we know that they contributed a very important function of seed dispersal for certain plants before they were lost. So they were the species that would eat a fruit with a big, hard seed, and they would carry that seed around, and they would deposit it. And that was one, was one of the reasons that forests had the composition that they have. Today, the species that were consumed by the gomphothere, pretty much the only thing that disperses them are horses and cows and sheep. So livestock that we've brought in, this is in South America and Central America, are now moving around these trees that there's really nothing native that's left that can move them. So we've had this interesting functional replacement. In the case of the dodo, where the dodo became extinct, they had, did a, they had observed some declines in population of a particular palm that had a big, thick seed. And they brought in, they introduced giant tortoises <laughs> to see what would happen. And the tortoises are moving some of those seeds around in these sort of big enclosures, kind of like you'd have at a zoo. So there's this interesting change that's happening where we have 
the species themselves, but we also have the function that they exert in an ecosystem. And many species can often exert the same function. This is a typical kind of network diagram where across the top we have some insects and then mixed in with them we have some flowers. So these are pollinators that are interacting with those plants. And of course, the pollinators affect the plants, the plants affect the pollinators, but we also have these interesting indirect effects where this pollinator interacts with this plant, which also interacts with this pollinator. So if I lose one pollinator, I might experience some sort of a shift or change in the densities of another. And those kinds of community effects are where my research lies. So particularly, one thing that I have been studying for a lot of years is the concept of co-extinction. Co-extinction occurs when you lose one species, and because you lost that species, you lose another in sort of a chain effect. So you might have a particular organism that's pretty resistant itself to these global changes. It can do all right by itself, but it lost some key partner. This is an example of a, a combination that I studied uh, for my postdoc a few years ago when I was living in Hawaii. On the top, you have the EEV. If any of you have been to Hawaii, it's one of the most dramatic honey creepers that we have left in the state. This particular bird is a fair, kind of a medium-sized honey creeper as far as that group goes, but it's actually the largest remaining bird in the group of honey creepers that's still present in, in really any numbers. Anything else that's around that same size is extremely critically endangered where there's very, very few left. And the larger honey creepers are all gone at this point. And the reason we've lost 71% of the honey creepers in Hawaii is because there's been this kind of a uh, perfect storm of, of changes in the environment. One is that mosquitoes were brought in. Mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii, so that was a, that was a bummer of an introduction. <laughs> so mosquitoes were brought in. Pigs were brought in, and pigs create these wallows in the forest. They sort of open up the forest when they do their rooting and their digging, and it creates some standing water. And the mosquitoes can breed in the standing water. And then avian diseases were brought in. And that happened mostly through the introduction of either game birds, um, things like chukars and pheasants are really abundant in Hawaii, or birds that were brought in as um, pet songbirds, and a lot of those then escaped into the wild. So in Hawaii now we have avian malaria, we have avian pox, we have some of these diseases, and the native birds are not at all resistant to those diseases. So many of them have become extinct. The EEV is still present, but it's pretty much restricted to high elevations, and that's because above a certain elevation you don't have mosquitoes. It's cool enough that they're able to escape the presence of those diseases. And meanwhile, you have this plant. This is one of 22 species in the same genus, known as Claremontia. And it has this amazing flower. You can see this really, really curved flower here. This is the, the flower parts that produce pollen. And you can see the nice curved bill on the EEV. And I hope you can kind of see how that bill would fit so nicely inside that flower. So the EEV will come in here, poke its head down here, stick its tongue out, and there's tons of beautiful nectar right in here, so it'll drink. And then the head of the EEV gets dusted with pollen from that, from that action, and then it'll move to the next plant. The difficulty here is that this plant only occurs at low elevations, and the EEV now only occurs at high elevations. So the two are completely disjunct from each other, and they don't overlap anymore. And I spent a year studying this particular plant and never saw anything come and pollinate it at all. I saw some birds come in and they will, not EEV, but other species, they would drill little holes in the side and they would steal nectar. It's called nectar robbing. And it's because they have small little bills and they couldn't make it all the way in through this nice tube to access the nectar in a way that would permit pollination. So this is a case where this particular plant is becoming rarer and rarer. We don't think it's getting pollinated. We don't think it's going to persist without some sort of intervention. And of course, the, this is a result of the loss from its immediate area of this particular bird. So we're kind of in one of these co-extinction relationships where eventually we might lose both partners. OK, so this is an, a topic that's been considered for quite a while. Back in 1992, there was a talk or there was a paper published called "The Empty Forest" by Kent Redford. And this was actually mostly focused on the losses of large mammals and large birds from tropical forests. And he pointed out that you could have a forest, it's full of plants, lots and lots of plants, beautiful trees, but if it doesn't have the right animals, that forest is already on some sort of an extinction trajectory because you'll lose all your seed dispersal. You'll lose the possibility of moving seeds around, replanting plants in various locations. And he really kind of raised the alarm bells about the fact that a lot of these species that we think of as just living in the forest are actually helping to structure the forest and make it the way it is. 
And all this then kind of became even more well known with the concept of ecosystem services, which this is just a, a quick illustration of. Ecosystem services are the idea that you have certain functions in an ecosystem, so you have things like seed dispersal or pollination, water filtration, the provisioning of habitats and soils that are services that are really important to people as well. So these are, are functions that occur in a healthy environment no matter what, but we are benefiting from them in some really distinct way. And the idea of ecosystem services has really spread a lot through the conservation landscape now because we're starting to recognize, okay, if you lose animals from a forest, you're gonna lose certain services as well and we can start to see some spirals where the whole region starts to, to go downhill and we start to experience some losses of diversity. So the specific set of interactions that I focus on, and I've kind of alluded to this with the examples I've given you so far, is what we call mutualisms. A mutualism means that you've got at least two interacting species. More often it's like a set of species that interact with a set of species. And both sides benefit from this interaction. So this is sort of the opposite of what we call a competition or a predation where one side is definitely not benefiting from the interaction. In a mutualism, it's kind of good for everybody. And I, I love mutualisms. To me, I'm a really idealistic person and I think they're kind of the perfect, like, oh, this is so cool, everybody's so happy, they all get to interact, it's great. So it totally fits my personality. But in reality, we've got species that are each getting something that they need from the interaction. That's kind of how it works and that's what maintains it. And some of the examples here, these are just kind of global examples, but you've got the clownfish sea anemone on top. And the clownfish protects the sea anemone, it cleans it, it defecates and its nutrients help to nourish the sea anemone. And the sea anemone protects the clownfish because it's got these stinging tentacles and so any predators can't get, to the, can't get to the clownfish. So that's a relationship. This is typical pollination, you've got a bee coming in. The bee is getting nectar and it's usually eating some pollen too or taking pollen to feed its young. So it has a goal here, it's gonna get what it needs but it's also trans transporting these propagules for the plant, which otherwise can't reproduce, it can't move those on its own. This is kind of a cool one. I know the picture isn't great, so I'm gonna try to explain what's going on here, but this is something called an extra floral nectary on a barrel cactus. Has anybody been to Sonoran Desert a fair amount and seen barrel cactus? They're very, very common. Next time you see one, go up close, and like 80% of the time, you'll see that they've got ants crawling around on them. And we don't tend to notice, because it's not like a swarm of ants, it's just, you know, a healthy number of ants running around. And what they're doing is there's these little tiny orange nodules that occur near the flowers but not inside the flowers on a barrel cactus. And they're there even if the cactus is not in flower. They're there all the time. And these little nodules are producing nectar just like a flower does. It's just a really tiny amount. And the ants come in and they drink the nectar and it's a perfect opportunity for them to get some nourishment. So then they claim this plant. It's like they're a barrel cactus. And any herbivore that comes in, especially other insects, so a beetle that's gonna come in and eat a little bit or some sort of a, a um, any kind of a vegetation sort of boring insect, the ants will chuck them off the barrel. They'll like go find the insect and throw it off because no, this is my barrel cactus. It's providing me with my constant source of food here. So it's a really cool relationship. Kind of similarly, this is cattle egrets on a cow, and of course they are pecking off some parasites and helping the cow to stay healthy in that way. And meanwhile, they're, so they're obtaining the food that they need, but they're also helping the cow to, to evade parasitism. This is seed dispersal. This is that giant tortoise I was talking about, eating a big old fruit, and it's gonna move it around the landscape and make sure it gets a place to, to land. And then this final example here, these are roots of plants that have been colonized by mycorrhizae fungi. So these are actually a fungus that infects the roots and it spreads out these long filaments into the soil and the fungus gathers water and it gathers nutrients and the plant can access all that. And meanwhile, the plant is eating some of the sugars that the, sorry, the mycorrhizae is eating some of the sugars that the plant is creating through photosynthesis. So you have this nice nutrient relationship on both sides. So mutualisms are really cool. They can be really surprising. They can be really complicated. They can be something that we definitely see in all ecosystems around the world. But it's a good example of a possibility for some sort of an interaction disruption. Okay, so here's the first case study I'm gonna talk about. This is the work I've been doing in Hawaii lately. 
Um, so this is work that's been going on for about four years, and it takes place in a high elevation, dry ecosystem in Hawaii. So this isn't probably what you think of when you think of Hawaii. We're not hanging out on the beach all the time. Um, this is about 6,000 feet in elevation, and it's an ecosystem that's dominated by shrubs and bushes, um, and also a lot of invasive grasses, which are pretty flammable, actually. So it's a place where fires do occur. It's also a place where um, these grasses were introduced for forage and livestock were introduced. So we've had a lot of a history of grazing by um, sheep and goats and cows. This is Mauna Kea, the tallest mountain in Hawaii. So this is all on the big island, if you're familiar with Hawaiian geography a little bit. And this is kind of in the saddle. This is also a military base. And the interesting part about that, being a military base, is that back in the 1960s, this whole area was fenced for military training. And as a result, all that livestock was kept out. So the, the cows, the, the sheep, the goats, a few of them kind of got in, but there was an active ranching that occurred after that point. And now this site hosts 18 endangered species, plant species that aren't found anywhere else. And it's just kind of been an accident that that's the case, but now we know about them. And so the area that I work right here is a protected conservation area on the base. If you go that direction a little ways or this direction a little ways, you get to these big open expanses of kind of new lava that are used for military training activities. So we'll be out there, you know, measuring plants and catching insects, and we can hear bombs going off kind of off in the distance. It's a really, really interesting place to work. It's quite a, it's quite a contrast. Um, but these sites are some of the most precious conservation sites that there are because they have species that don't occur anywhere else. It's been, a, it's been sort of a fascinating place to work. Okay, so the focus of this project, and it's a collaborative project with a number of different partners, we're trying to look at this area. It's a highly invaded ecosystem. It's high elevation, so it's dry. It's a little bit stressful kind of environmentally. It's tropical. What we're interested in is, first of all, all right, what's the current pollination that's happening in this system? What's pollinating what? What have we got in terms of this ecosystem function? And then we're interested specifically in, well, what about non-native predators? There's been a lot of predators introduced to this system over the years, and we are wondering if they're impacting the pollinators. So we're trying to see what non-native predators are doing, and then we are implementing these experiments, and I don't have any results yet for this part, although the experiments are wrapping up now, but where we've controlled non-native predators, and now we're trying to see whether that changes things in terms of these pollinators. So the linkage is that you've got invasive predators here, they're eating, supposedly, or we think they are, native pollinators. And then those native pollinators, because they're being eaten, that should have some sort of an effect on native plants. So it's kind of this indirect relationship. These are the plants that we're looking at. And none of them are particularly familiar to you, probably, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on their actual identity. But across the top, we have four endangered species. So these are listed endangered species. This one here is an aster. You can see these tiny little flowers here. Tetramelopium arenarium. We have Stenogenia angustifolia, which is this really interesting mint that is kind of a tubular, small red flower that grows in a vine kind of along the ground. We also have another mint. If I skip over here, this is Haplostachys haplostachia, which grows kind of in this um, uh, very dry, sort of upright structure, but has these really pretty flowers when they open up. And then we have a catchfly. This is Silene lanceolata, and has the stickiest flowers ever. It's such a pain to work with, <laughs> but it's really interesting. Okay, and then across the bottom we have four native species. They occur only in Hawaii, but they're not endangered. They're pretty common still. And among those we've got a couple more asters. We have Biden's um, menziesii here, Dibatia linearis here. We have a poppy, Argemini glauca. There's a very similar looking poppy in our area here in Arizona. Um, and then we have Cytophallus, which is a mallow, sort of like a uh, globe mallow, but just bigger, grows in a big shrub. So those are the species we're looking at. They're varied in flower type. We imagine they should attract a lot of different pollinators. And we've got some that are super rare and some that are not so rare. OK, and so what we do, well, number one, we do pollinator visitation observations. And that means we spend hours and hours and hours and hours watching things come to flowers, <laughs> just nonstop. We're constantly watching to see who's visiting and what they're doing. It's, it's, Kind of funny, it's a massive amount of effort. Um, I just recently ran a report, I think, for this past year, and the eight plant species have each been watched. The minimum any one of them has been watched has been 80 hours over the course of the year. The maximum has been 140 hours over the course of the year, so it's a huge amount of time of people just sitting by flowers and watching them. Um, but we're trying to see what's coming in. 
So the second thing we do, pollen transportation assessment. So just because something comes into a flower doesn't necessarily mean it's a good pollinator. So we do catch a certain number of these and we swab them. So we'll take a bee like that and we'll rub its little body on a little square of this pink gel and then we melt that onto a microscope slide and it makes the, any pollen grains that were picked up really fluoresce, like bright, bright pink. So then we take it back here and go to the microscope and we can kind of see how many pollen grains they're carrying and if they're carrying the pollen of the plant that we're interested in, or maybe a diversity of plants. And then finally, we do a series of pollination treatments. And so that means that we're directly manipulating flowers. Um, there's a few, you can, totally can't see this, but there's like a couple of bags and sort of images here. Those are treatments that are on this particular plant. There's usually four things we do. The first is we just have certain flowers that are we don't do anything to. We usually tie a tiny string of embroidery thread around the base of the flower so we know that we're kind of following that flower and then we just let it be. And we're interested in how many seeds are gonna come out of that. So it's just like, what's happening? Are these getting pollinated and how much? Additionally, we do a hand supplementation where we take certain flowers and we will apply some pollen. And the idea here is, well, maybe we've got sort of our standard control, which is open, and maybe it's gonna produce five seeds, but if I directly add pollen, will it produce 10 seeds? And that'll kind of tell us that they're not necessarily getting all the pollen they could handle from that general ecosystem and how it's functioning. We also do a treatment where we put bags on some of the flowers and we don't let pollinators get to them. And this is a way of testing if a plant is self-compatible. A lot of plants will produce will produce seeds anyway, but those seeds are from their own pollen and it's a form of inbreeding. So there isn't a lot of genetic diversity that could result from that. And it's a good thing for plants to be able to do it if they're very rare, because they can kind of reproduce for a few generations. But you would expect that if this is the only way they're reproducing over a long time, that that won't be great in the long run. And then there's a kind of a control for that where we put the bag on, we take it off, we put some pollen on, we put the bag back as a way of just making sure that the bag itself isn't causing whatever um, decrease in seeds that we're seeing. And then, finally, and then finally, we are trying to understand what the predators are doing. And so our three predator types, we've got rodents. Uh, these are house mice and black rats, kind of your normal, typical rodents that are everywhere. Ants and yellow jackets. None of these are native to Hawaii. So Hawaii has no native ants. If you've been to Hawaii, you see ants everywhere. They're on your counter, they're climbing up your walls. They're, I mean, it's a tropical island, they love it. But they're all introduced. There are no native rodents in Hawaii. It's the most isolated archipelago on the planet and they just couldn't get there until they started to come on ships. And so the, the mice, the rodents, they're all completely introduced. And then yellow jackets as well. So we take the poop of the rodents, we take ant stomachs and we take yellow jacket prey balls. Yellow jackets will take a bite of the prey and carry it to their nest. Um, to offer it around to the rest of their crew and tell people to go back to that prey. And so we can catch a yellow jacket and take away that, that bite, <laughs> and then we can see what it is. And we're running DNA to see what it is that they are eating. And our interest is in whether or not they're actually eating the pollinators that we've identified. Um, and then finally, and this is the part that I don't yet have results for, but it's been, this has kind of been our focus for the past two and a half years. We set up these big plots, there's 20 of them, they're 150 meters by 150 meters, they're really large, so like a football field and a half kind of, by a football field and a half approximately, all across this area. And four of them, we've, we've put in rodent controls, so we're keeping mice and rats out of them. Four of them ant controls, four of them yellow jacket controls, four of them all of the above, and then four of them we just kind of leave as they are. Now this effort to keep the predators down is a full-time job. So we have five crew members that work 50 weeks a year, 40 hours a week up there trying to keep the predators out. They just come back. Like there's no way to actually keep them out without having that active intervention. And so we have these big control stations and then in the center, we've got this little central area where we figure, okay, we're like keeping them back. There's this big buffer, no predators, no predators. So the center should be our best protected area. And we stick out potted plants of all of our focal species. And we're trying to see whether they're getting pollinated by some different set of pollinators when there's no, when there's no predators around. So that's, the part that so that's the part that I don't have results for yet, but I thought I'd show it to you anyway as kind of like the ultimate goal of the project. 
so, and these, and these are our potted plants and how they look. This is actually a staging area. So we've grew them in greenhouses, then we put them up there for a couple weeks and try to get them habituated. Um, and then we distribute them around the landscape in the center of these plots and kind of put them down in little divots where they won't experience too terrible of sun exposure. It requires carrying water in backpacks for you know, lots and lots of distances across lava. It's, it's a pretty intensive project. We actually have a boot allowance for our crew where they each are going through like three or four pairs of boots a year. It's kind of crazy. Um, okay. Um, okay, so this is the first set of results I'm going to show you. Here's a diagram. I'm not going to go, I, I don't really like throwing up a ton of graphs. I'm going to do a few, but I, I don't think that's the best way to kind of convey the results. So um, what we have here, this is a network diagram. Across the top, each of these squares represents one of our plants. So there's eight plant species that we're looking at. And then down here, these are all of our flower visitors. And what these results are for is this is before we put in the predator controls. This is just what was happening in the first year that we spent up there. And any line that's connecting a plant to a pollinator, that means that there was an observed visitor there. There's some sort of an interaction that's occurred. Um, and this was an interaction that could have been a real pollination interaction, like that particular visitor was in the flowers doing what it should do. And the key take home here is that the green lines that you see, those are interactions from a native pollinator. The, the purple, this one is kind of an odd one out. This is probably native. This is a pollinator that, it's a genus of bee. They're called yellow-faced bees. And there's a lot of native yellow-faced bees in Hawaii, but there's also a few introduced yellow-faced bees. And they're so small, and they come in so quickly that we can't be 100% certain which one this is. Probably native. The gray are examples of, those are pollinators that we're not actually sure if they're native or not. So typically, those are very small moths. Um, things that we're, we're able to sort of see them flitting in, but we can't tell exactly what they are to species. We do our best to catch them and identify them with entomologists, but we can't necessarily do it. I'm not an entomologist myself, but we do have an entomologist on our um, set of PIs working on this project, and he's one of the best entomologists in the state of Hawaii. But it still can be difficult to tell when they're sort of flitting through. The red, however, is known non-native species in this ecosystem. So the red pollinators are by far the dominant visitors in this particular system. So again, we have eight native plants, four of which are endangered, and they are being visited almost entirely by non-native pollinators, which was a surprise. We knew there were non-natives up there, but we had no idea that the large majority of everything going on up there was going to be done by non-natives. And to kind of refine it a little bit, we took out the ones that were sort of occasional visits, like maybe just once in the course of a year we saw something come in, or very, very rarely. And so we have just our, what we call primary visitors, and it actually gets even more dramatic. So this is the network when it's just the, the more consistent visitors. Now we've got one known native, one probable native, <laughs> a couple of unknowns and everything else is non-native. So it's just been this incredible dominance of non-native pollinators in the system, which is fascinating. These non-native species seem to be bringing in this function that otherwise might not be happening. We don't really see native pollinators in this system beyond just a couple examples. And then finally, the, the last sort of refinement was we caught as many as we could to swab pollen off their bodies. And all I'm showing you here is the same exact network, but if it's kind of white, it means that we weren't able to get any pollen off their bodies at all. If it's gray, it means that we got a little bit of pollen, but not all the time. So we would like catch one individual that had no pollen, the next one had a few grains. The, the bright colors are the ones that just consistently, every time we're carrying pollen. And now it's even more restricted. So there's the one that's probably native, and then there's really just three non-natives that are carrying almost all the pollen in the system. And this one here, number five, is the honeybee. So that's the introduced European honeybee, same one that visits all of our crops, same one that people are concerned about worldwide for population declines, and it is definitely doing the majority of pollen transportation in this particular system. And it is, it is subject to the same impacts in Hawaii that we have elsewhere, where there's parasites in the nest and there's some diseases that have been recorded. Um, okay, so this is the only scary graph slide, and I do not want to focus on it. I just wanted to show you one quick thing with it. These are the results of our actual hand pollination treatment. So I said we go in and we actually work on the flowers, and we cover some, and we hand pollinate others. So the key here is the things, first of all, that are circled in, in purple. What those are is those are seed productions, the, the number of seeds that are produced. It's the third column in each of these graphs. So it's the number of seeds that are produced when we put a bag on the flower and just step back and let it do its thing. So it's not exposed to any pollinators. 
And the key is that every single one of these produces seeds. So no matter what, they are able to produce seeds even when there's no pollinators in the system. So that's a, a result of selfing, self-fertilization. So that would be an inbreeding event, but they are producing seeds, which is a good thing um, for at least the short term. However, in almost every case, it's a considerably smaller number of seeds than they're producing under any of our other treatments. So they produce seeds, but they don't produce as many. And that's kind of what we would expect from inbreeding. We figure, well, they can propagate themselves, they can continue for a few generations, but they're probably not going to do as well if this is the only way they can, they can reproduce. And then the other one to point to draw your attention to is I circled just a few of these in blue, and the ones I circled are the ones that are, are kind of the strongest effect. That's when we've gone ahead and added pollen. Um, so you have your general open, just unmanipulated flowers here. We've just watched and seen what happens and the amount of seeds they're producing. And then we add pollen, and that number is jumping up in a few cases. In the other cases, it's not a significant difference. So I just circled the ones that so far we have significant impacts from. But what that means is that these particular individuals are not receiving all the pollen that they could handle. If we add pollen, they really reproduce more successfully. Um, so that means that something in the system isn't kind of perfectly working for them. But we still do have quite a bit of pollination that's occurring. So the very first bar in every single case is just this open general pollination or general production of seeds for these flowers when nothing's been changed for them. And they, they're all producing seeds and most of them are producing more seeds than if we stick a bag on them. So this suggests that there's, there's pollen moving around. There's pollinators doing their job. There's things happening. These, plant, these plants are reproducing better than if there was nothing, right? Even though what we have there is almost entirely non-native. So these non-native pollinators are effective to some degree for these plants. Whether or not they're as effective as the natives, we don't know. The natives are gone in most cases. And then this is the predator diets to this point, and we, we have not been able to yet refine this as far as we want. We're using DNA for this again, so we're trying to get genetic uh, barcoding, it's called, of the poop samples and of the, the prey balls. Um, but to this point, they've only been able to get it to um, the pretty general level. So this is a, an, an insect order level. We have Lepidoptera, so this would be like caterpillars, moths, butterflies. Hymenoptera here, this would be your bees. Um, potentially your ants, other kinds of social insects. We know that most of our visitors are probably Hymenoptera or Lepidoptera, so they're either going to be the honeybee, the native bees, or there's a few butterflies and moths up there. Um, so it's interesting that our, that our invasive predators are eating Lepidoptera and Hymenoptera, but we haven't yet been able to get the resolution to say what species they're eating and if they're the actual species that we're seeing visit. So we've been working on that. We're actually, um, we've been working with a genetics lab in Colorado to run most of these, and they were sort of able to get it to this point. But some of the results were a little bit fishy, and we have a new collaboration now with someone right here at NAU that's going to rerun all of our samples, um, who also has worked in Hawaii for a long time. And one advantage there is that he sort of knows if he's seeing something that really can't be there. <laughs> like the ones in Colorado gave us some results that there was some marine creatures up there. <laughs> we were like, something's off with the DNA here. So we're going to be rerunning all of this. OK, so I'm going to transition for, the, for a few minutes now. This one won't be quite as long um, to talk about the study in northern Arizona. And then we'll just stop for some questions. So I figure another five or six minutes of listening to me. Um, so this is work that I've done. I'm going to show you results from two springs, spring season of work up um, near the Vermilion Cliffs in northern Arizona. And we've sort of gotten to a point where we've really opened up a lot more questions. And so it's work that is definitely going to continue beyond this. So it's, I, it's really an initial study. But this is the Ficaisen Plains cactus. It is so cute. It is so beautiful. Um, it's known as Pediocactus. That's the genus name. And there are six Pediocactus up in that area. All of them are endangered species. Um, and this cactus, I mean, it is, it's amazing. So this is my husband's wedding ring next to the cactus to give you a sense of size. They are tiny. They are so, so, so tiny. This is three little plants all in a row. Um, you can find them in April, pretty much, when they're in flower, late March to the very early part of May when they're in flower. Otherwise, it's, it's almost impossible to find them because they're just so small. And they kind of blend in. And then the crazy part is when, th when conditions get rough, so if it's a little dry or if it's a little cold, their roots will contract. And the whole plant sort of 
like ducks down <laughs> a little bit and it's very loose soil up there and the soil kind of blows around a lot and they'll literally get dusted over with soil where they're actually underground. So you truly can't find them. You'll go up there and you're like, well, there were plants here a year ago, but they're not here now. And then a couple months later, they're back. So it's really, really weird. Um, but they're very beautiful and they're really cool. So these are occurring, you know where the Grand Canyon kind of comes through? Actually, I think I have a map. Uh, I'll get there. <laughs> I do have a map. <laughs> so they're kind of near where the Grand Canyon's about to open up, but I'll show you that in a second. So this is work. Initially, I did this with work from um, Arizona Department of Agriculture. There's this small fund that they offer called the Section 6 Funding for Research in, on Threatened and Endangered Arizona Plants. And this particular fund, um, it's administered by Fish and Wildlife Service, and they have a list of plants that they're concerned about. And so this is what ended up funding this work. And this is one where they're like, we just don't know. We don't know why they're this rare. We're wondering if they're reproducing. We're wondering if they're getting pollinated. And there's a couple things. They, they occur over a range that includes some north of the canyon, some south of the canyon. There's different land use histories. Some of these areas have been very intensively grazed over the years, some not so much. Some have been more almost um, sheep and goat grazing, others cattle. So there's a, there's a diversity there, and they're just interested in, well, what might be happening? So to start out with, that was the goal of these first couple of seasons, was just to see what's going on and what's visiting the cactus. So here's my map. <laughs> okay, so here's the Grand Canyon right here. If you go up this way, so this is Navajo Bridge. This is the Ver Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. Um, 89A must be somewhere here, I think, coming up. Um, so Flagstaff is sort of down here. And so this is the area we call Marble Canyon, which is like the opening of the Grand Canyon, right? It's, it's sort of unzipping there, and then it really opens up down here. And the plants, here's three populations I looked at up here. So this is Vermilion Cliffs, House Rock Valley, Kaibab Plateau. And then the other population is actually south of the canyon on Babbitt Ranches land. Um, the Babbitt Ranches has been super, super supportive of learning more about this plant species. So mostly I did flower visitation observations again, just like I described, tons and tons of time watching. I had some students up there. My daughter, she's 13, and for my birthday one year, she gave me an entire day of watching plants. It was very sweet. <laughs> It was kind of adorable. We've tried camera work as well, and actually it works better because there's like one flower per plant, so we can really sit the camera there. Um, so we've done what we could do to try to get a sense of what's happening. We've not done anything manipulative with these plants, so we haven't tried to mess with their flowers at all. And that's at the request of Fish and Wildlife Service. They're just not confident yet that these guys are producing enough seeds to mess with that. They, they don't want to interfere with the reproductive output. So, so far it's all been observational. Yeah. And in those two springs, so these plants are only in flower for a little while. An individual plant, that, those flowers will come up for a few days in a row, and then it'll sort of be done. In the first year, there was very low, or very low flowering, so we would often not be able to find any flowers to watch. In the second year, it was a little bit better. But so total, we ended up with 69 hours of observation. And in that time, we saw only two times that any pollinator came in at all, which was shockingly low. And in both times it was this, it's this little native bee. This is not a good picture because we were like chasing it around trying to get a picture. <laughs> we're like, wait, come back, you just visited the plant. So this is like the only chance we actually got. But it's a little greenish metallic bee. Again, it's about the size of an ant. It's not very big at all. Um, it's a native bee, but there's several in this species, and we weren't able to catch it, so we don't know which, or several in this genus, sorry, so we don't know specifically which species it is. Um, that came in at both the site on Babbitt Ranches, and it came in at one of the sites that was up by the Vermilion Cliffs. And that was it. In all that time, we only ever saw those two visits, which was amazing. And that, um, that included cameras, that included all the people that were out there watching. Um, I've never worked on a plant that was visited that little. And so it's really a mystery what is going on up there. And there's a couple of things to kind of note. Um, so there were some difficulties. We feel like this is just opening up lots more questions for us. Very low flowering the first year. On average, a site would only have one plant in flower. When we went up there, we'd have to search for it, and then we'd find it. Um, there was a very high rate of bud failure. So that meant in this picture here, here's kind of an open flower. Or it's probably about done, and another one. But this is a bud, so they're sort of beginning. They're like a little bulb that's sticking up on top of the plant. And often, we'd find that those would just kind of shrivel up and fall off without ever opening. And I think maybe they were freezing. It's a little hard to say, um, but you know how if you see a, a vegetable or something in your refrigerator that got too close to the freezer and it kind of gets mushy and a little bit, it kind of just 
the color gets really muted and dull. You can just sort of tell this thing froze and it shouldn't have. That's kind of what they were like. And so we think maybe they were freezing. We're not sure. There was also a lot of weather in that first year um, where there was kind of an unusual number of cold spells and storms that would come through, which was great for having to be out there and hanging out with the plants. But I called it plant happy hour. These guys would only open when it was nice and warm and sunny. So even if, so I would drive, it's like four hours from here to get to the populations. And I'd be hanging out there with the plants and they'd like, the flowers would open at like 10 in the morning. And then it started to get cool and windy, and so they'd close at 4, and they were done for the day. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're off to happy hour. Like, they just were not available to pollinators very much. And if it was a cold day, they wouldn't open at all. I'd spend the whole day sitting by a bunch of closed flowers. So it was tricky. And, and I guess the point is we don't necessarily know exactly what's happening, um, but we do want to try to further explore this. So there's a couple of things that we think are worth continuing to explore. Extremely low visitation rate, zero visitor diversity. One possibility is that maybe there just are not very many pollinators in those areas for some reason. And that would imply that kind of across that landscape, we've got something that has really reduced the number of pollinators. The, the term we use in pollination ecology is depauperate. It's an area that used to have pollinators, but now it doesn't. And that would imply some sort of broad um, sort of ecosystem damage. And we don't know, um, but that's one possibility. And in that case, we're trying to understand better what other plants in the area are getting visited and how they're doing. Because there's some common plants up there. There's globe mallow and there's Indian paintbrush and a few others. And so we're interested in understanding whether this is sort of specific to these regions or if it's more just specific to this particular cactus. And then we, we also don't really know the implications for the cactus. Most cacti are self-incompatible, and that means that they shouldn't be able to produce seeds on their own with no pollinators. But there are exceptions. And I did uh, find some fruits on these guys um, indicating that some of the flowers are turning to fruit, but I wasn't allowed yet, or they, we haven't agreed that I'm, o I'm okay to like open up the fruits and see if they've got any seeds in them. So those are some of the things that we, we need to try to understand a little bit better. The arboretum here in town um, has some of these growing. And so if they can get to the point where they're producing flowers, those I might be allowed to look at and say, well, we know nothing pollinated this. Are they producing fruits or seeds? And then we'll get a sense of whether or not they're truly reliant on pollinators. So there's a lot of questions to be asked. And I'm still up there working a little bit. We had a conservation biology class from NAU that went up last weekend. And they are looking at just general uh, density of possible pollination nesting structures. Most native pollinators nest in either dead wood or directly in the soil. And so they were looking at the occurrence of dead wood across these landscapes. There's one site up there where cattle have been excluded for about 60 years. And so it's a little different inside there. There's more shrubs and things like that. So we're looking at some of the differences in soil stability within and outside of that exclosure. We're just trying to get a sense of what's kind of going on. And I should say that these sites now don't have very high levels of grazing. The grazing is actually really quite, quite low. But historically, there was quite a bit. And so that is one hypothesis, is that maybe there was some level there that did cause some damage, and now they're kind of in recovery. But there's just, it's hard to kind of really pinpoint and understand what might be going on. So just to kind of wrap up, and then we can have some questions. So, you know, this is another of those network diagrams. And this one I just pulled from a, a colleague's paper that they published. The point here is these are really complicated things to try to study, right? You've got tons and tons of species interacting with tons and tons of other species. In this case, these are insects across the top and plants here, but these are big groups of insects even, like Surfidae, that's an entire huge group of flies. These are other flies, these are bees, so there's dozens of species within each of these categories. And trying to understand what happens when we lose a few or gain a few is really hard. And we can't really look at every single one of these relationships, but we're doing our best to, to more and more understand what the implications of some of these changes are. Of course, of course we do know that some species have been lost. Um, I had pointed out these two earlier, but I didn't really mention this guy was on my title slide. This is the Hawaii black mamo, which was one of those extinct honey creepers that used to be very large in body size, and it had this amazingly long, enormous bill. And there's an estimated 38-ish species of plants that have become extinct since this guy became extinct. And it may very well be that there's just nothing else that could serve that pollination relationship the way this particular bird could, and now it's gone. 
so those are things we're sort of trying to catch in the act and understand as they're happening so that we can get a sense of whether there are changes that we can prevent, whether there's non-native species like livestock that could come in and replace some of these, or honeybees that could come in and replace some of these, um, or if there's ways that we can kind of bring back the natives by doing things like controlling predators. So those are some of the ways in which we're trying to understand whether co-extinction is happening, perhaps be able to prevent it um, along the way, or at the very least get a sense of what the, the changes that we're seeing are really going to mean for those broader communities and those broader functions. And that's pretty much it that I have for you guys today.